here's what I thought we would do today. I thought we would explore your personal car journey. There's a lot I don't know about the beginning of it. And then get into the collecting, your theories on what's collectible and, and car storage and the rest. But first, what I love to ask people on the podcast is, where, when did you know that you were a car guy? When you were young, wh what was the moment? Well, um, there was a kid next door to me where I grew up that had a tractor uh, <laughs> that you could pedal and, and had a steering wheel. And it was metal. And I had never seen anything like this with a seat. And a, it was the seat and the steering wheel. Right. And this metal body to it. And um, so this is about four or five years old. I would go over to this kid's house in the morning, knock on the door, and ask his mother if I could borrow the tractor. <laughs> and I would do that every morning. Mm -hmm. And eventually, that mother went to my mother and said, do you think you could buy him one of these things because he's <laughs> constantly coming over here? And uh, I just uh, shot a, a special for uh, Netflix that's coming out, a, a stand-up comedy special. It comes out September 19th. And we have footage, a lot of my home movie footage, and there's footage of me on this tractor. Wow. And, but that was the one that I got. That My father, he went and bought one, and he brought it home. And in the station wagon, we had a, um, a black and white Plymouth station wagon. I think it was like a 57. And he, I remember him telling the story that he pulled into the driveway with the tractor, put the car in park, turned around, and I was on it <laughs> in the back <laughs> of, the, of the station wagon. <laughs> now, these things, I'm sure I see some uh, older guys here that you probably remember these things. So it was a metal wheel with a hard rubber uh, um, you know, type of tire around the metal wheel. And I wore out two sets of that hard, <laughs> really hard rubber on suburban sidewalks. So that was probably, now I didn't know what that was about. Right, right. But that was really the beginning. The beginning. And, but, and then, I mean, if I could jump to, um, I would say I was about uh, 11 or 12, 68, 69, and my uncle took me to the New York Automobile Show. And that's where it really lit up. Because otherwise, my parents' cars were just, you know, you know ordinary Detroit stuff, Ramblers. And Do you remember what you saw there that, that was that moment? Yeah. Um, I remember just the Porsche logo, the Alpha logo, and the MG logo. Those logos. I'm very, um, I'm very into uh, graphic design of, mm -hmm. of everything, of, uh, aesthetic of everything. And, but those logos, particularly the, the Alfa Romeo logo is one of the most exciting things I think I've ever seen. <laughs> you know, you look closely, it's a serpent eating a baby. It's a horrific image. <laughs> but nobody, can you believe? That's what they had in mind. Yeah, nobody, yeah. nobody minds that. And, they, and I think they're still doing it now. They put the baby <laughs> back in the serpent's mouth. Are you aware of that? No, I'm not aware of that, Yeah, no. the Alpha logo on the right side is a serpent consuming a baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I love that. The Alpha logo, I think, is one of the great logos. Then the Porsche logo. So that leads to the car magazines, I'm guessing. The car magazines. And the dreaming. But what, what's the first car? What are you doing, like, in high school? Are you able to afford a car? No, no, no. No, couldn't afford anything. Did you get your license when you were 16? Yes, I got the license the day I could get it. I was into... You know, then the Stingray, the Schwinn Stingray, oh, is, uh, sure. if you're of a certain age, that was another thing that <laughs> lit up a quadrant in our brains. Like, oh, they're going to make a bike that... Has a stick shift in the middle. Yeah, Gears. and you can, when you stop, yeah. you can just put your feet down <laughs> and talk to a girl in the neighborhood... <laughs> with your hands on the thing, <laughs> and that's the first time you realize, oh, I can use this machine to express myself in a, through, in a, in a, in a form of mechanical culture. Right, right. That was another step, but even that was, I would say, an interim step to, and I'm gonna say, the MG brand, when I was a kid, and this is pre-Porsche, I wasn't even aware, the MG brand and what they were building and what they looked like and felt like 
that was really the my big bang moment. Yeah, you of, see that little two seater with yes. the cabriolet, and you go, right. I want to be that guy. Right, I right. want to be that guy. I, I don't know what guy. life goes with that car, <laughs> but that's right. what I want. That's I right. just want right. to be a guy whose life, you know, when you're young, you're 15, you just imagine, gee, what kind of life am I going to have? I didn't really care, honestly, mm -hmm. as long as that car is in it. And what, <laughs> what was your first car? What was my the first, first car? My first car was a bought? Fiat 128 Sport L. Right. which I just found another one. Uh, very hard to find these things. They dissolve like Alka-Seltzer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I found one in Portugal. I was just walking through my living room. You know how you, you got that damn phone, uh, which is you know, responsible for 90% of our hobby. And I just mm -hmm. went, Fiat 128 Sport for sale. Let's see what comes up. And boom, there it is in Portugal. And it's got 30,000 miles and original interior, original everything, 15 grand. And it was, you know, I've been looking since 73. <laughs> and, and, but that's another story. But did you buy it? Of course I bought it, yes. <laughs> and buy it now. Just I bought button. it because it had rack and pinion steering. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was educated by road and track. Rack and pinion steering, transverse engine, independent rear suspension. Okay, that's it. McPherson right. struts, right. you know, and it was one of the most exciting car moments of my life, Spike. It was just a few weeks ago, and I haven't even really driven it that much. I got it, you know, you go through it, you sort it out a little bit, make it work, and I got in it. And now, between that car in 73 and now, how many Porsches? I've had everything from a 917 30 mm -hmm. to a Gamund, and every Porsche iteration in between. and. I got in that Fiat and I drove it around and I went, I was right. <laughs> I was right. This was a great car in 1973. What do you think you're buying a little nostalgia with that car too? Is, is, more than a little. No, more than everything. a little. Right. You, you're kind of buying back your childhood a little bit. Oh, the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but focusing on the technology of mm -hmm. that time. Right. I thought, I don't want a Mustang. I don't want. That's not advanced. Mm -hmm. I want a transverse engine front wheel drive car. I don't want a big <laughs> heavy drive shaft. I want, I want forward thinking. So how, how long do you drive this car and where are you driving it? Are you driving it when you're in college? Is that your... Yeah, I drive it in college. I, I start my comedy. I sell the car mm -hmm. to get, which I sold it for, uh, it was 2600 new and I got $1,400 for it uh, four years later with uh, 70,000 miles on it, mm -hmm. and I took that um, $1,400, and I moved into Manhattan to try and be a comedian. There you go. Well, it worked out. It worked <laughs> out, yeah. And now I got the car We can back. thank Fiat yeah. for that. <laughs> they took care of them. Um, yeah. So you're in New York City, you're a comedian, and maybe I'm wrong in remembering this. Is there, what's the, that comedian car that you bought where you, you drive around with the other comics to the clubs? Did that ever happen, or was no. the Mercedes the dream in car? In New York? Yeah. No. Yeah. There was no cars in New there York. There were no cars. You didn't have a car There's in New nothing. York. So, nothing. So no. where do we pick up after this Fiat? You sell it, you become a comedian. Yeah, I become a comedian, and uh, I moved to L.A. I need a car, mm -hmm. and I, I, I bought a Fiat 124 sedan. But you're kind of skipping over a piece All here. All right, let's go. Let's just go back to how did you get from MG, which is what is the life of a guy that has an MGB or an MG midget mm -hmm. that, first of all, he only has two seats yep. because he's only interested in, in his buddy or a girl, <laughs> and that seemed like a cool way to live. Right. You know, why do I want somebody behind me, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm in my car? Exactly. But the connection of why, I, I think the real question of why we're all here this weekend is why does a car make you feel cool? or good, or correct, or whatever, whatever what, what is it that a car does mm -hmm. that gives you this feeling that you want? Why yeah. do we pursue them? I think that's the Do you question. have an answer for it, or you're just going to pose really. it? Not uh, really. <laughs> uh, I thought you I were mean, about to share some ultimate wisdom about this. Well, it started with the sting, we started with the, with the tractor, right. then we went to the Stingray. Yes, the and, Fiat. And, 
Well, no, the Fiat was all, I was very deep. But deep I want to know what you bought. What did you buy after the Fiat? When is the next? This is when the, I had a little money. Yeah, when you I had a little money. I bought a Saab Turbo. A Saab I Turbo. I always wanted to have the leading edge of technology. <laughs> and where did the and, money and come coolness. from? And coolness. Technology that isn't geeky, but it's it's geeky, but it's cool. Uh -huh. You know, like design cool. So you got to have a design aspect. You got to have quality engineering. And you've got to have uh, tactility and sensation. You've got to have all those things right. for it to be a car that it, I, I think these things are, this mechanical culture is a type of aesthetic um, fashion in a way or mm -hmm. expression of who you are and how you want to go through the world. When, when you know, when young people here, they have other yeah. ways of exploring the world. For us, the automobile, well, with that, I could see the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in the 1400, you'd want a little sailboat or something. Right. You For know. me, it was escaping from my parents. Escape I from your parents. Wanted a way to drive away from that, them. That's just another way of saying, go see the world. Right. You want to. So. so <laughs> what? What is funny about that? I don't know. They're enjoying it. <laughs> you, you're, you're in the Saab. Is this LA now? Yeah, I was in LA. I had a Saab got the turbo. Saab. And everyone, and, and black. And everybody's going, well, you know, why didn't you get a BMW? I go, this is the thinking man's BMW. <laughs> <laughs> but still, we're not into any collectible cars at this no, point. We're no, we're not. So no. is it Seinfeld? Is it the series yeah. where the money starts coming in? Yeah, then you know, I had too much money. And you start making choices? <laughs> yeah. And it's the 88 911? Is that the first? I, I already had that. I, was, I, I bought that with a stand up comedy you did. money. Yeah. That was the, so you had your eye on a Porsche back then. Is, is that, what is the moment where you go, Porsche? Porsche 911? Well, that moment, we're going to go back now to 1415. Road and Track taught you. The thing that got me about Porsche was no grill. Right. There's no old man grill <laughs> in the on front. The front. Yes. It's and the hood just drops down. Yep. And all my parents' cars, you could see the horizon before you could <laughs> see the end of the hood. <laughs> and I thought, where is the road? What, what, uh, is the road out there? It's out there somewhere, but we don't know where. And the first time I got a, a, my father's friend had a VW Beetle, mm -hmm. and I got in that, and that nose goes down. And the road's right there. And to me, the car thing, especially the sport, if you're a sports car person, you're trying to connect with the road, mm -hmm. which is another quadrant of psychology we could explore. Yeah, yeah. Why do you want that? Why is a plane not interesting? <laughs> because, it, you know. But anyway, so the Porsche thing was no drive shaft, no grill, no heavy uh, cooling system. Mm -hmm. So I thought, these guys are, they're thinking differently. They got their own thing. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to care what anybody else is doing. Nobody else is making rear engine air cooled cars. Why are these guys doing this? And then, you, and, and then they would win. They have these comparison tests and they would win. They would say, this is the most fun car. This, <clears throat> and I like the design that of um, um, aesthetic economy. There was an economy right. to Porsches that Camaros and Mustangs and GTOs uh, Pontiac, I mean, didn't have. Had you driven one before you bought one? No. You no, hadn't? No. So you, where did you buy this car? Was it in Beverly Hills? Beverly Hills Porsche. You still uh, have this car? I still have the car, yeah. The black car? Yeah. Is it... Um, January 20th, 1988. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are your children's birth dates? Can you write a Lowe's off? Yes, I can. <laughs> um, and did it live up to your expectations, that first drive? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because of the steering. Okay. You know, once you, you know, uh, please excuse my uh, Porsche enthusiasm, if, but uh, once you feel a steering mechanism with no heavy cast iron engine laying on top of it, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, there's no going back. Right. Because the sensation of steering, I, I had to fill out this thing for Christophorus recently. They had some questionnaire. What must a Porsche never have? What must it always have? I don't remember the other one, but what must it always have is great steering. Great steering is, to me, the essence of the automotive experience. Mm -hmm. the, the performance, uh, acceleration, all that stuff, all that's secondary to me to great steering. Great steering, and I, you know, I was talking to 
our friend Steve Serio last night, and he was saying he has a 911R, the new one, and he can't slow down, and he goes too fast. I go, I, I don't have that problem. To me, when I'm in that car, the sensation is so great. I don't care if I'm doing 30 or 130. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm about that. What's the communication between your senses and the car is communicating the road to you? And what is that back and forth communication? So let, let's, let's take the 911. You're, you're on Seinfeld. You're yeah. doing the show. Where? Because I came into that late. I, did, I, I was on the show the last three years, and you'd had a couple cars. What's the moment where you know you're going to start collecting these things? You know, what's the moment where you have to figure out, I, I need a hangar at Santa Monica Airport right. to put cars in? You well, know, do you know what I mean? Because it, Yeah, but I don't think there was a moment. Uh, may, here, here's the moment, okay? So I have this 88 911, and then I, I buy a 91 964 C4, and that's kind of, in, in, okay, oh, I see these things kind of progress, and I start reading more of the history. I didn't know really about 356s until the 80s. Right. I didn't know about them. The mm -hmm. 911 was really my car. And so um, I start trying to figure out, what, what's the deal with these 356s? What are they about? And I'm looking at them all. If you just try and understand 356s, there's so many varieties, it's just completely incomprehensible. The Cabriolet, the Roadster, the A, the B, the C, the Forecam, the Push Rise, like, I, I couldn't penetrate it. It was just mm -hmm. too much stuff. And, but the Speedster kind of jumped out at me. It's like, oh, this thing seems like the pure expression of a sports car, a small two-seater. And I love the shape of it. I love the little windshield, the little lightweight seats. Uh, I thought, that's a cool shape. I'm going to buy one of those. I'm sure you can't drive it because <laughs> it's built in 1958. <laughs> but I'll buy it, you know. Uh, I mean, the money's pouring in the windows at this point. i got to do something. <laughs> I'm a single guy. I'm not, it's not furniture and art. <laughs> Quick sidebar about art, which I hate. <laughs> uh, somebody was asking me about art. Some art dealer came up to me the other day. He says, are you interested in art? What do you think of art? And, you know, they was trying to hustle me, you know. <laughs> do you like art? I go, yes, I love art. I love it. I, I said, I just don't think it's valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the truth. OK, so. <laughs> So I buy this 58 speed store in Wichita, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And is as this an the white, object. The, the white one? The Dan No, the aquamarine car? blue. The aquamarine blue. Yeah, okay. with the brown interior. Yes. So I buy this car in Wichita. I paid like 60, 70 grand for it. And it runs. Mm -hmm. And I bring it back to West Hollywood as, a, as an art object. And then I start driving around the street. And I go, this thing drives pretty good. And then I'm going out in traffic, and I go, wow, this thing's, it's only a 60 horsepower, but it gets down the road well. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I'm on the 405 doing 100, <laughs> you know, and I'm going, oh my God, these are, how could this, and then, and then the Porsche addiction really kicks in. Oh my God, these guys are making cars in 58 that can handle themselves in, in, in 1995 traffic? Yeah. They're, they're, this is, this well, is we've often said if you were going to winnow your collection down to one car, it might be the 58 Speedster. Yeah. The one car collection that just delivers all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, and usable, like you're saying, just usable. Right. You don't want to crash it like our friend Zuckerman does. No. You no, know, because it kind of wraps around you like a soda can, and then they have to peel you out. But right. I'm going to move this so it's a little Yeah, okay. so we don't breathe them. Um, so you've got a speedster. I recall you had two speedsters that were identical like that. Uh, they were consecutive serial numbers. Right. Yeah. So is that where it starts to get crazy, that moment where you go, let's, let's Probably. <laughs> get another one? Well, he, so no. Th the moment is when you bring home a 58 speedster and find out this is not an art, art object. You can actually use this. Right. Then right. you go, OK, well, what else is there? Right. And then you're gone. Right. Assuming you have a hit series on NBC in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I, I take that for granted. <laughs> I remember there was, there was trouble with one of those speedsters that had a long history of crashes. The one yet, that I liked that I should never have sold. And there was one that was perfect that you did sell. Yeah. With. Oh, I, I probably had 10 of them. I buy, I, I'm still, I'll buy another one right now. Wasn't there a slow, slow motion crash on the... One of them tumbled down a hill, yeah. No, there was a stagehand while we were shooting. Oh, our, oh, the forklift. Yeah. Right. Why did, were you in the car? No, no, I was around. It was in the parking lot uh, where we were making this series, and I don't know, I was moving the car around somewhere, and there's a forklift, and he's coming at me, and I'm honking. I don't know how the guy didn't see me, I but he's either. coming. Imagine the forks, <laughs> you know. But, it, but I, I had somebody, a Jim Perrin, mm -hmm. uh, 356 Geeks might know that name, who did the history on that car, uh, which he would do. I don't know if he still does that. He'll make all the phone calls, find out all the owners, get all the stories, and puts together a little book for you. It's so wonderful. But uh, he found out that that car had been rolled down mountains. And, you know, I mean, that car had been through such hell. The, fork, the, the forklift did drive into the car. While I'm in it, on the horn, I'm sitting on the horn. Stop your forklift. And bang, into the car. Back over to Brace. I remember the day you came in with a Tangerine 73 RS. Yeah. Now remember, you know, I'm at a different point in my car collecting. Like, I, I showed up on my first day of work in a, a 74, a 911 with yeah. 200,000 miles. Right. And you, you, you looked at it and you said, right idea, wrong example. <laughs> and I went, it's nice to meet you too, Mr. Seinfeld. <laughs> goes, you better get a new car. And I was like, I thought I was here to write scripts, <laughs> but uh, ended up, you know, you're exactly right about that car. Um, that 73 Tangerine RS, that's another moment for you where, yeah. where suddenly there's speedsters. There's, and I remember you took me for a ride on the 101. Remember, we went on to the on ramp. Mm -hmm. You're like, look at how fast this is. And I thought, this is not as fast as a modern Porsche because that's where my head was at. Right. You know, just new Porsches and silvers. And, but um, that car, um, where are you now in that moment? So you've, <laughs> you've got Well, that's, that's, then, then you get injected with the RS right, serum. Right, And you find, oh, so that's another formulation. <laughs> you know, the Speedster was one idea, of uh, open, kind of uh, minimalist thing. Mm -hmm. And then the RS, well, what about a car that's not for everybody, but it's kind of like a race car that we kind of uh, civilize a little bit. Let's, let's take a race car and civilize it. So you could drive it on, as your car on the street. And that's what RSs are, and then, that's, then, then you're on that drive. See, now that's the moment at the beginning of your collection where the, the, the dealers and, and the guys you know who are selling these cars, now they know they've got a guy who wants to hear a story, right? And for you, you know, share with everybody how you find these cars and vet these cars. Like, what's your methodology for doing well, that? Well, uh, I, I met Sam Cabilio, who, who was my uh, car consigliere, when I went to buy that second Speedster, because I talked to Bert Olander down at Circa. Right, I said, do right. you know anybody who could look at an old car for me and tell me if it's any good? Right. And he says, yeah, I do know a guy. And he introduces me to Sam Cabilio, who I'm still with to this day. So that's uh, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, uh, one of these great uh, true enthusiasts, but his business is buying and selling old Porsches, and which he's been doing since the early 70s, or maybe even mid-60s when he got back from Vietnam. So he then fills my head with all these other ideas of things you can get. So now you got a guy who knows a lot with a guy who's got a lot of money <laughs> and wants to get into this. And it's, uh, you know, it's uh, nine and a half weeks with uh, Mickey Rourke yeah. and uh, <coughs> Basinger. You know, now these two are just going to town. But he was, he was knowledgeable. He was uh, sincere. He was uh, totally uh, ethical. And we start, what the, what the car community collector car community started doing about 10 years ago, I started doing 25 years yeah, ago. Yeah, right. What's an Abarth? What's a 911R? What's a 4Cam? What's a uh, uh, 930 Turbo with a power factory power kit? So he's giving me all that, and he's got this whole Southern California network, which, as Jay Leno says, mm -hmm. every car ever made is somewhere within 30 <laughs> miles of Southern California. <laughs> That's you, right. you know, 
<laughs> well, that's not true. I mean, th I remember when you said you found the last uh, 356 made, and it was in a cornfield half buried. Do you remember that story? Is that the, the green That would be the first 911. That's the first 911. Yeah. So how does that, how does that come about? Hemmings. It was I'm flipping Hemmings. through Hemmings, and they're selling the first 911 <laughs> ever made in one of those little Hemmings wow. ads. You know, 64, the first 911 ever made. That's incredible. You dial the number, some guy in Michigan. <laughs> you get the VIN, you know. You, you call the factory, and it is the first 911 ever made. And I bought that for 300 grand. And was it, it was underground? It was half? It was, it was really totally deteriorated. <laughs> uh, and so I. And this was, uh, I, I think, uh, a prescient, if I can use that word. It's a company. I think I can. But what it, so it, I say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send this car to Porsche in Germany and have them do the restoration, because that will really enhance the authenticity of the whole thing, which I, I did. And, uh, they dis and they displayed it alongside the 1 millionth 911, mm -hmm. which was just made at the Museum of Modern Art last weekend. Yes. Yeah. There you go. So I, I was a little ahead. A little ahead. Do they know how you feel about art? <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> well, let's keep that quiet, everybody. I, don't want I them love to art. Done. It's great. <laughs> but a guy with his hands on his face is not worth $100 million. <laughs> <laughs> screaming. OK, so he's screaming. <laughs> Fine. I'm not getting $100 million value here. <laughs> When it, this is a, a question about what you'll buy and what you won't buy. It, what condition, and that car is an example of it, what, you know, when you look at a car, what's like the least amount of car that's left that you feel is restorable? Well, it depends on the history of the car. Why, mm -hmm. why is the car even have any value? Right. You know. Um, but, you know, as, as far as a project, what... You know, what do you like more? Do you like a car that you have to go back and restore and put back together? Do you like it restored? I've done Are you that a preservation a, guy? What I, is I've your done setting? that a number of times. I'm kind of a little over it, although I did just start a, 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 a 65 uh, four cam cabriolet, dolphin blue with a blue, uh, dolphin gray with blue comp and interior, mm -hmm. one of the last Carrera 2s, uh, 356. Mm -hmm. So I, I went for that. But normally, I'm kind of, my restoration days are kind of over. OK. Yeah. And what do you look for in a preservation car? Because uh, you know, there was a little bit of a hubbub with this speedster a few yeah. years back. You know, uh, factory preservation versus the guy who owned it preservation. Right. And whether that has any meaning, the little modification someone does with a one-owner car. Like, what does preservation mean to you? Preservation means, do you like the story? Mm -hmm. If you like the story, and, and another huge aspect of cars that we don't really think about too much is the guy you get it from or, or, the, or the woman that you buy it from. What are they like? <laughs> if that experience is nice, the person that's selling you the car, not only the going through the deal-making process, but the person themselves and what they say about it, the type of person they are. If you like them and you kind of like that, gee, they, they have a sincere appreciation. This is not just about money. Mm -hmm. If it's not just about money, you're on the right path of buying something and kind of wanting to carry it on. You know, uh, I've bought cars from, I bought that 59 GS 4 cam from that old veteran. He's in the wheelchair. He knows he's dying, you know, and he's got this car and his, um, the money that the car is going to bring, which was, uh, over a million is going to change his wife and his kid's life. But he doesn't want the car to go to some broker and get it volleyballed around the community mm -hmm. and everybody trying to take a piece and it's flipped and it's auctioned and it's... He wanted someone that got it and liked it to have it. So that's... That becomes... That guy becomes that car. Mm -hmm. That becomes the story. <clears throat> Everybody uh, asks the, the, the first question you should always ask, what is the story? And if it's a good story and a, and a person that you could hopefully even connect with a little bit, then you always kind of think of that person when you get in the car. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, won't, 
you probably won't, uh, no, no disrespect to David Gooding, but you probably won't think of David Gooding when you <laughs> buy a car at an auction <laughs> and think, oh, that David Gooding, he's a hell of a guy. And he is a hell of a guy. He's, he's a great, great. guy. But, but you know what I mean. Yes. The personal connection, the connection to the person, mm -hmm. then to the car, then you have something that could mean something right. to you. Well, when do you buy at auction? I mean, you do when buy at auction. I, so do. I do. When it's something that I, uh, I know I can't repeat that out uh, elsewhere in the marketplace. Right. So it's one of a kind. One one, of yeah. One. For some reason, I know I'm not going to find that on my own. Right. When I saw that 58 Speedster that no one had taken particularly good care of and was in decent drivable condition, mm -hmm. uh, that was two years ago, I right. knew I wasn't going to find that again. I want to talk just a second because it's. Uh, I, I know this about you. When you're out here in LA, well, down in LA, you sleep with your cars. Yeah. You stay in the garage, and right. you're, you're with them. Yeah. Um, share with us like what's important uh, about that hangar space as far as you know. Are there humid humidity things that you do, and is there Not optimal really, no. temperatures? No. no. <laughs> like, what is your hangar space, garage space theory? Like, if someone were out there wanted to put together a place for storage. I, I, you know, don't, don't mess it up with a lot of crap. <laughs> uh, stay away from wood. You know, don't have a lot of wood. Why? I don't know. Wood has got like bugs in it, and it's, uh, <laughs> it cracks, and it corrodes, and it deteriorates. Uh -huh. Clean. I like clean. I, I love, you know what, I, I love a gallery space. Mm -hmm. I like when they take an old concrete floor and polish it, and it's clean and it's, uh, you know, uh, pretty, but it's old. Mm -hmm. You know, I love this thing that they're doing now with some in the VW community. They're clear coating some of these old patinaed cars, and I, I love that. Just take a car that's kind of a little rusty and the paint's faded and, and just clear coat it. Just kind of preserve it. Are, are there cars, do you have car regret when you sell one of your cars? I know. Uh, was it two years ago at Amelia? You mm. sold 16 cars. Mm. By the way, have you replaced those cars? Yes, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have. I have. Are you sure about that? I'm not. No. That wasn't. That was a. That was a very small part of your collection, yeah. right? And, and right. Th that decision was what? Well, what that was an editing decision of, if you have uh, five cars that you like, and someone says to you, well, if you can only keep two, which two would they be? And you go, oh, no one ever asked me that question before. And you look at them, and you go, to tell you the truth, the two that I really love are those two. And the other three I just keep because I like them. And so I'm 63 now, and I'm thinking, why am I, I somebody else could be enjoying this. I'd rather spend all my time with the two that I love than five where I love two and really like the other three just for the variety. I want to put more miles on the ones that I Love really ten like. out of you know the ten out of ten. Cars. And they're, they're, you know when you see them in a magazine, do you feel, do you have pangs? Do you feel yeah, any? Yeah, it's a little weird. <laughs> little pang. It is a little are, weird. Are there yeah. cars that you've sold that you end up buying back, and, and what would that be? There was one car, uh, a '92 Cup car that I bought new from Beverly Hills Porsche nice that I store. sold twice, bought it back twice, plus buying it new, so I bought it three times. I've now recently <laughs> sold it again, so I have a chance to buy the same car a fourth time. <laughs> well, why are you doing that? I don't know. No. Uh, <laughs> what was that? No, because I, I keep thinking, you know, you know what, here's, here's the dumbest thing a, a car people will think. You look at some car that you have and you go, do I really need that? That's the dumbest question. You didn't need any of it. You, this, <laughs> Need is, a, is not an applicable verb no, in this no. world. No. Air and water, that's all we really need. Yeah, that's need. all yeah, we really not need. Not 964s. Right. But why are you thinking about doing it again? Is it the, the old No, no, I'm not going to buy it back again. You're not? No. Well, um, all right. Well, before we take questions from our friends out here, uh, are you going to buy anything this week? Are you I, I am looking at some, some things this yeah? week. Yeah? Yes. Anything you want to talk no, about? No, I don't want to talk about it. These are my, <laughs> these are my competitors. <laughs> They're not going to yeah. bid against you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I always feel pretty safe when I buy something <clears throat> at auction because I know I'm as crazy as anybody, and the the money and the crazy. <laughs> there's very few people that can, uh, yeah, you know, you know, match both. What do you? But wait, I had one more question for you. I really want to know the answer to these. The, the idea that's modern collectible now. Now mm -hmm. it used to be cars that were maybe. 
10 years old that suddenly became collectible, like 997, GT2, GT3 RSs, GT2s. Now it seems like with the 911R, the 4 GT, there are all these new cars that are instantly collectible. How do, maybe, you, how do you feel about that Maybe, stuff? maybe. I, I, a, a typical arrogant human attempting to predict <laughs> the future, and this is what people will want in 2035. You don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> the, the lens of time is, is, uh, is solves everything, and nobody, but, but nobody can jump forward in time. Like I was saying this, Mike, the sport jacket jeans thing that everybody is doing, we're going to be laughing at this in 15 <laughs> years. What were we thinking? I'll be laughing about it in five minutes. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it's the sticker price, though. You know, you know how 911Rs were, you know, they were sold yeah. by brokers, and suddenly you're seeing them at 600,000. You're seeing the GT2 RS right now being sold $200,000 over sticker. People just to sell their spot. Right. Wait, you know, wh what is that? Is that oh, anything? That's just, that's just the mouse and the cheese thing, where they just <laughs> will move the cheese a little further away, the mouse will go after it. You yeah, know. that's all. It's, yeah, that's all that is. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I, I do kind of believe that this. This does feel like the, the uh, peak of the internal combustion engine. I don't think in 2035 it's going to be the propulsion system of mm -hmm. the masses. It's going to be, so I think these cars that they're making now, it does kind of feel like a last gasp in a way that maybe if you're uh, a, a, a fuel burning type person, you might want to <laughs> grab some of these things. I do, I do believe that, but I don't know which ones. Nobody knows which ones right. people are going to really want. Who mm -hmm. knew the soft window, target, plastic rear window, <laughs> is going to be what people are going to want in 50 years because it turns yellow and cracks. That's right. what we want. <laughs> yeah, that's what's cool about it. <laughs> All right, we're ready uh, for your questions. If you guys have a question for Jerry or myself about collecting, we'll be happy to try and answer it. Go ahead, whoever wants to go first. Just sure. All right, so what would you say are some similarities between uh, car enthusiasts and comedians? Oh, cars and comedy, Jerry. Fun expert. Uh, there isn't much. Uh, most comedians uh, do not um, relate to cars. I don't know why. Um, mm. For me, I mean, in my particular interest, um, a great joke and a great car, everything on it works and there's nothing excessive that doesn't make sense or doesn't need to be there. I'm mean, going to go back to the speedster idea. To me, the speedster and a great piece of comedy are identical. They're perfectly minimalized mm -hmm. ideas. I would say I've also seen you, um, you know, you're a professional racer of a sort on stage doing comedy. Oh, it's a very yeah. stressful business, mm -hmm. and you're mostly a guy who relaxes behind the wheel. You know, gets in the PCH and drives and yeah. comes down. Yeah. You know, that's the only relation I can see. I'm the same way. Right. Uh, I'm not a racer. You're not a racer either, right? No, I don't like uh, <laughs> trying to prove that I could have been a great car driver, <laughs> but I never got the chance, and I'm going to show you here on Pico what I could have done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's next? <clears throat> Hands up, uh, this young man. May I ask you, what is your favorite, or two of your favorite, cars in your collection, Porsche is in your collection? Oh, uh, what is exactly. your name, young man? My name is Demetrius Lahiri. I, I'm sorry, you took the mic down. My name is Demetrius Lahiri. Oh, uh, Demetrius, I, I love your outfit. You look oh. so nice <laughs> today, you. especially your little pocket square. Thank you. I'm <laughs> very um, impressed with your parents. Um, <laughs> well, Don't Demetrius, um, I would say um, uh, the Speedster would be one of my uh, favorites. As one of, uh, and, and an early 911, the 1970 911 ST, which was a race car that's still civilized enough to drive on the street. Those would be my favorite 356 and favorite 911. Yeah, killer cars. Who else? Over here. Let's take someone on this side. Hello. Hello. Adjust your hair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got to do it. What do your wife and kids think about your collecting? Ooh, there you go. <laughs> well, he's flying home right after this, so that tells uh, you everything you need to know. The kids are, you know, uh, the, your kids are always going to be opposite of you. So my, my kids think, 
or one of my kids thinks that I have all these cars to show off, so he kind of doesn't <laughs> like it. And I explain, I don't, I'm not trying to impress anybody, I just like them. And so he always asks, if you come to pick me up at camp tomorrow, don't bring a different car. <laughs> <laughs> Just bring the same car every time, like a normal person. <laughs> uh, my favorite thing with my wife is she will catch me uh, at 2.30 in the morning uh, on my uh, computer in my underwear, uh, <laughs> looking at cars and not porno. <laughs> and... That's my favorite moment when she catches me, you know, I'm, you know, I'm on Bring a Trailer. I'm not on Bring a Tailor, or, you know. Fantastic. In the back there, you get a microphone on this gentleman here. I'd like to ask you a question about a specific one of your cars. Can I show you what it is right <clears throat> quick? You could just tell me. I know what I have. Uh, <laughs> He's I up. asked because apparently the fabricator f that worked on that worked on my car. And I oh, just yeah, that's if there's my America Roadster at, at John Wilhoit's. Mm -hmm. Just wondered if there was a story behind that particular car. Well, it um, raced, didn't it race here? The America it did race here, and it raced in a... Uh, uh, what was it called? Pebble Beach something in 1954, and it raced against 5503, and they crashed together, and I own both of those cars today. <laughs> and I have it. There's a black and white shot of two of them nose to tail racing, and it's one of my great the car collecting moments to yeah. have both of those cars back together. Uh, we should recreate the crash here yeah. next year. <laughs> Just drive right into each other sure. in the parking lot. Do we have we, a couple more questions we have time for? Go ahead. Sure, right there. Thank you. Do you have a car that got away? Oh, a boy. purchase you were bested Everybody in? Does. or? Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear it. What is that? Well, there was a Swiss guy who had a, a 356 uh, Gamund. I think it was number two or three uh, Porsche ever made. And I made the deal on the car with the guy, and then he decided he couldn't bear to see the car leave Switzerland and, and decided not to sell me the car and sold it to somebody else. But I, I have another uh, early Porsche that is... Uh, I have the earliest unrestored Porsche. So that, that's good enough for me. That's the uh, Gamund, I'm, right? That's the Gamund, yeah, yeah. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did your, did your subliminal tractor deal ever express itself in buying a Lamborghini since he started out as a tractor builder? Um, so did Land Rover. That's a little bit of a thin connection <laughs> there. Uh, I thought he was going to say, did you ever buy a tractor? Yeah. <laughs> did you ever buy a Porsche tractor? I do have a Porsche tractor, but the, <laughs> the five-year-old tractor jumped to the Lamborghini. Uh, uh, that, that's a, you're way out on the branch there, sir. And a very, you're out on a twig now. <laughs> We have time for a couple more quick ones. If anybody else, there's somebody in the back here. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts on um, keeping them completely original or starting to modify like these outlaw things we're seeing and replications mm. and that sort of thing. Um, not my personal taste uh, because I, uh, I kind of got to the point that I like the story of Porsche. And if I want to go faster, I just get into something newer. Uh, and I like, this is the way it was at that time. The time travel aspect of old cars, to me, is a big part of the fun. When I, I, and I, I live out in uh, East Hampton, and there's a lot of roads out there where you can't tell what year it is. So if you get in a 63, and that's a 63, everything on it was made in 63, you can kind of go into that little dream like, well, gee, if I was, had this car in that year, this, it would be just like this. So um, the uh, increasing the G-forces uh, on old cars is not my particular taste, but uh, I, I don't really. Though have you a do it every it. once in a while, you go, I have done it. You yes, go through I a phase. The, the the Smothers Brothers Speedster. Yeah. The 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 roof 911, that 71 yeah. S that you designed with Sam. Yep. 
And yeah. Volkswagens. You go through these weird Volkswagen cycles, yeah, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, I do. These, these I, little storms. Yeah, I love Volkswagens. <laughs> and you buy them, and then you get them, and then you sell them very I quickly. I do sometimes, yes. Yes, yes. yes. And you were in one not long ago, I thought. Maybe two months ago I talked to you. You said, I'm obsessed with 60s Volkswagen. Late 60s uh, Beatles. Is album. there anything else other than Porsche that you collect in Volkswagen? N no, I mean, I have the Fiat that I found. Mm -hmm. um, you got a Formacino, what is that thing, that scootery thing? The, uh, the uh, room, uh, Roomy? Yeah, the Roomy. Yeah, well, that was a counterfeit. That, that didn't work. <laughs> I love Lambrettas. I, I love uh, late 50s Lambrettas because they, they're, I love the design, and I love that they went out of business. Mm -hmm. Vespa survived, so they're not as cool. But Lambretta didn't, so they're the cool ones. So right. And I have a, a really great Lambretta that I do drive. You don't have a motorcycle? You don't no, ride motorcycles? No. no. I was a motorcycle guy at a certain point, but uh, uh, I, then I didn't want to take the risk. Yeah, and definitely not now. Yeah. Any, any other questions? A couple more? Sure, anybody. Hand him a mic and let them ask. This will be good. So what do you think about Ferrari? And oh, uh, if love, you like technology, why, why not augment your collection with some of those? Um, yes. I love, first of all, I, I am an Italophile. I, whenever I go on vacation, I always go to Italy. I only, I only uh, wear Italian clothes except for the <laughs> jeans. Uh, I only eat Italian food. And uh, I have as, buy as many Italian things as I can. And I love Ferrari. I don't have any. I'm, I'm kind of scared of the Ferrari collector world. It scares me. <laughs> the numbers and and you hear stories of things that were fake and it's just a little too scary for me and I've driven them I adore them is there a Ferrari uh, you've always wanted if uh, you were a Ferrari guy what would that be if I had a Ferrari uh, I I mean the uh, I I'm uh, I uh, uh, Ralph Lauren is a friend of mine and he has a fantastic Ferrari correct collection and I've uh, gotten to be in lots of them, and uh, the GTO, I drove in his GTO and drove it, and that, that's the greatest car I've ever been in in my life. That, that is the most exciting automotive experience I've ever had, so I, I love them. But no, I've never had the right, it would have to come from somebody. If Ralph said to me, you know what, I'm thinking of getting rid of something, I'd like you to have this, then I would love it because it's from him and we're friends. and. So I would need some kind of emotional connection, I think, to get me into that world. One more question in the back there, this young man. This is awesome. OK. Uh, speaking of loose connections, you have Acura as a sponsor for Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Yes. Um, being a huge fan of the show and during the filming, always seeing in front of the apartments a uh, white Acura Legend sedan. Yeah. I'm curious about the connection there, if you had a hand in those cars that were chosen to be in front of the apartment and sort of Are your connection. Are you talking connection. about the TV series? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, well, no, that's just a coincidence. Wow, OK. My first <laughs> the, car was the an Acura Legend. was the 90s, <laughs> and I did Comedians in Cars in 2017. That's sure. when Acura was my sponsor. Sure. Or 20, a uh, few years ago. So no, I there's no connection I guess a better there. question maybe, why uh, did you choose Acura for that partnership, or was there any? They just were the most uh, motivated to be part of the show. We've now, I, I now, uh, um, the show has moved to Netflix uh, now, so, uh, and I've got Lavazza, the Italian coffee company, which <laughs> I know you'll appreciate that. So Lavazza is going to be my new sponsor. And how do you pick the cars on Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee? I, I pick them based on the people, uh, you know, uh, Cars remind me of people and vice versa. So I try and find a car that's like that guy. So the Louis C.K. Fiat Jolly, what was that thinking? <laughs> Louis is a Fiat Jolly. He's a guy that makes no sense and still somehow exists. There's no reason for Louis C.K. to exist. There you go. <laughs> well, we're going to end it right there. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Jerry Mike. Seinfeld, everybody. Thank you. Car collectors, comedians. Very well done. Thank you.